Welcome you here to Liberty Main Line on this rather gloomy spring morning, but it will our hearts will be warm and cozy in here. So um, I'm delighted to see all of you. And um, would you please join me in this call to worship? Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell out his salvation from day to day. God has gone up with a shout. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. He has led captivity captive and given gifts to his people. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell out his salvation from day to day. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Tell out his salvation from day to day. Let's pray. Almighty God and loving Father, who has made us to be one family and who has sent his son to preach peace and mercy to all of us, we pray that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. We pray that you bring all the nations into your fold and pour out your spirit upon us so that we may be ambassadors of your eternal kingdom now. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Please rise as we sing the first hymn. Please be seated. Hear this call to confession found on page three of your worship folder. No one who conceals transgressions will prosper, but one who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. 
When I was reading this this morning when I came in, one of the first things that came to mind was when I would ask my children to clean up all the dishes and candy wrappers and snack papers from the playroom. And I'd say, gotta, gotta clean this up. You know, every couple of weeks or so I'd go down. And to my great unhappiness, I might find a month or so later when I opened up a cupboard that they had all been stashed in there to fester and get kind of disgusting. But that's what we want to do, right? When this, even though that was not a transgression on their part to have the papers there, we want, if we sin, we want to hide it. We don't want anyone to know. We don't want to acknowledge it whether because we feel guilty or because we're lazy. We just don't want to do it. It's too hard. And yet, as the Proverbs say, we won't prosper because things that are left inside, things that are left hidden, will fester, rot, maybe eat us from the inside out. So this is why we should confess. Get it out there. Throw it away. Let God take care of it. So please join me for this prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Let's take a moment to silently confess our sins. stand to receive these words of pardon. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 
And yes, Chris, I understand and I know that it was your sister putting her stuff on your side. So you are, you are pardoned. <laughs> Please remain standing as we sing. <laughs> Our children are excused to go to Sunday school, and our older children will have some meetings with Ty for Hive downstairs as well. The rest of us, please greet one another, pass the peace, and say good morning.
please be seated. I really just have one quick announcement. I want to remind you that next Sunday after church, we will be having our congregational meeting and lunch. We'll be talking about how far we've come so far. It's been a wonderful year and what we hope and pray for in the future. Most importantly, child care will be provided. So I invite you all to stay and join us for a meal and just some time of fellowship. Now today, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. He is probably a familiar facha to most of us. <laughs> um, Vito Baldini is a minister in the Liberty Net Communion. He is a minister of mercy. He's just been tireless in reaching out to the community. He is also the executive director of Small Things, which is really kind of a misnomer because it, in fact, is no small thing. They deliver and provide you know, millions of pounds of food per year. It is an incredible operation. And so I am just delighted to invite Vito to come up and share his wisdom with us. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here today. Um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be good. So, <laughs> at least that's my prayer. So, uh, first, I want to just thank you guys. Uh, so, one thing, you guys are a supporting church, a small things Philly, which we are extremely grateful for all of your support to help us distribute food across the region. Uh, we've done 20 million pounds of food since 2020, so I wanted to share that with you across a lot of partners, serving a lot of people with direct service sites. Now, you can find out more at our website. But my purpose today is to come to you to, uh, to speak on a passage in the Old Testament that is one that is quoted very often about seeking justice. So I'm going to get it right into the text. I'm going to take a minute to pray, and then we will uh, share the words from the Holy Scriptures. So let's take a minute to pray to prepare our hearts to hear the Word of God. Lord, before this world's day even began, your Word was in the beginning, and it was with you and it was you. That mystery brings us to our knees. Yet today, you allow us to open your word to know you better. So we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and give us open hearts with your spirit. Amen. Now hear the holy words of the scripture from the Old Testament book of Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of the body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So as I was sitting here and I think about this passage, I can't think about the passage and the words of the Old Testament prophet Micah without thinking about our current situation. And I look, if you guys just open the news app and you go through and you read whatever the newspaper is or the world news head that you read, you can't see, you can't not see that there's wars. People are dying. There's division politically, socially. And even if we just take a lens and we zone into Philadelphia or the main line, there's the opioid epidemic and addiction. There's gun violence. There's a lack of affordable education or a good education system. Or maybe we look inside our own lives, our own hearts, the divisions that are created between us and God as a result of addictions 
or struggles or habits or selfishness. You can't look at the world and not see how things are broken and fractured and divided. But what I want to share with us today is that there actually is good news and that the Christian story actually gives us a way to enter into the actual things that are fractured in ourselves and the world and gives us a tangible way to actually participate in a solution to the larger problem. So that's what I want to share with us today. I want to share, us, share with us about the story of Jesus and how the story of Jesus invites every one of us into a mission. And that mission is to help restore the brokenness that we see in the world. So the text opens up with a very, que like a very clear question. It's not unclear at all. It says, so what does the Lord require of us? And I'm not going to get too much into the context here, but what I am going to frame this question is when he's speaking, he's actually the prophet speaking to the people of Israel who in the Old Testament were the people of God. And today the people of God would be considered the church, the local church, the community of God, us right here gathered as we open the scriptures, we do the sacraments, we, we come before the Lord. That is the community that God is speaking. So the question today is what does God require of us, the church, in the world? And I want to just kind of give a, a quick summary is Micah was speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel, okay, and he was a prophet. And the role of a prophet really was to speak on God's behalf. And a lot of times what a prophet would do is he would remind people about what their intended purpose was. Because along the way, people get lost. They get confused. And the prophet would be like, hey, like what you're doing is actually not what you're supposed to be doing. So a prophet, in a way, speaks on behalf of God. He reminds us and he corrects us to put us back on the right path. So Micah was speaking to Israel. And he, he opens with this. So then what shall God require? And, and there's all these phrases that are kind of like a little crazy, if you ask me, because we're in uh, the world that we live in today is much removed from the world back then. It says, shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, for the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? This seems really weird, okay? Like all of those things. But back then, those things were quite normal. So I'm going to like pull it to us today and just give a couple of examples. This is kind of what they would have heard. To put it in modern terms, these gifts may include giving up a year's salary. Like just give all your money up for a year. Give it up. It might have been like permanently giving your car away to allow someone to borrow the thing that helps you get to and from work, the thing that allows you to like kind of do your livelihood. Um, it may mean like a moving a stranger into your already crowded home just to live for an unexpected amount of time. There's not like an end date on it. Really, these things weren't just like things that we're saying. They were actually really tangible things that were like real sacrifices. They weren't like they were not things that people needed. They needed these things. So these sacrifices actually were real sacrifices. So what is it that God does require of us? And the prophet sums it up. He wants us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. So God doesn't want your stuff. Like, he doesn't want it. He doesn't care about it. He doesn't need it. It's not what God needs to exist. He doesn't need everything you have. But what God does want is God wants your heart. He wants the center of who you are. He wants your whole person. Because when God captures you, he gets everything you have. The stuff becomes irrelevant. So I want us to look at what does that mean today? What does it mean to do, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? And the first thing that I need to talk about, 
And I need to make this, this clear because this is the reality of the situation. I opened up talking about all the things that are distorted in the world. And I only gave a couple of examples. I'm sure if each of you went in your mind, think about things in your life that you don't like that are not congruent with like maybe what you believe or the things that you think. Think about the world and how you see it's all messed up. Well, the reality is I think all of us can agree that there is things in our lives and things in the world that are not right. They're off. That's for everyone. So in order to do justice, which is the first point, we have to deal with this word, sin. And it's a word that may feel uncomfortable. It's a word we did just did confession, and maybe you come every week and you read the words of confession, and we talk about them, and we just kind of say them, and we reflect. But this word, sin, is actually a very powerful word. And I want to say it's actually the word that, that that feeling that you have, that things aren't right in yourself and in the world, that is the word sin. It's a thing that's come and invaded God's good creation and skewed it and marred it and made it not right. And for individually, the, uh, another prophet in the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, he actually talks about sin this way. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That the human condition is that we are fractured, we are broken, we are not right. Sin causes us to fight for our own survival because we are the most important person in our lives. We fight at all costs for our own survival and turn inward in self-protection. And guess what happens? Sometimes that's at the cost of other people. We may take advantage of other people in order for ourselves. Not only are we broken, but the world is broken. The systems that we exist in, that we function in, that we live into every day are fractured because sin doesn't just affect us individually, but sin affects us systemically and socially, in all that we do. Some people have access to things that other people do not have access to. These are realities in the world that we live in. Privilege is a real thing. Where you grow up, the color of your skin, your gender, and your family of origin affect the things that you have access to in the world. The systems are sometimes set up to give some people advantages over others. The systems that we live in. Sin is selfish at its core. And it is the opposite of justice. It's almost in competition with justice. So we must deal with our own sin first because sin can contribute in ways that we may not even acknowledge into the larger broken systems. Our individual sin can in ways actually help to keep the unjust systems functioning. So we have to deal with our own sin first as God works to renew us And the world. So, in order for that, God had to actually do justice. For us to do justice, God had to do justice. So, Jesus, as a payment for the sin of the world, in the text in 2 Corinthians, the New Testament author Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 4 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God or the rightness of God or that God was putting something back together. He was making something that was wrong. He was fixing something that wasn't right and making it right. That's how Jesus paid the ultimate price for sin. So all the things that you think that aren't right in your heart and all the things that the systems in the world participate, God on the cross right there 
took it on himself, all the ugliness, all the sickness, all the thoughts that you've had that aren't right, all those things, God took it on the cross in order for the world to begin to be put back together. And that starts with me and you first understanding that we have a need for God to make us right. In my experience with recovery, um, You, I, was a, I was an addict, and there may be other people in this room that are addicts or have struggled with an addiction. You are not getting better. It ain't, it's not happening if you can't first acknowledge that you actually have a problem. So the first step in all the recovery programs, NA, AA, starts with us acknowledging our own weakness, our own limitations, our own addictions, our own bad habits, our own sin. And that is the first step that we can build the foundation on any kind of justice work that any of us are ever going to do. We have to start first with ourselves. And from there, we can then grow out into joining the restoration of what Christ is doing. We can't only live for ourselves, but we have to live for the benefit of others. And in order to do that, we have to understand what God has first done for us in the gospel. So to do, one, one author talks about doing justice this way as we're starting to now move into the societal way that we understand it and actual ways that we can do this. First, we have to acknowledge our own sin and our own weakness and accept that Jesus is our Savior. And when he starts to put us back together, we can then begin to think of others, think about the ways the world are broken and participate in the healing that God has done in Jesus. To do justice means to work for the establishment of equity for all, especially the powerless. I talked about that systemic injustice pushes some people to the margins. We have an obligation and a responsibility to do justice, to care for those people. So we have to think of others above ourselves, where sin is going to tell us to think of ourselves above others. Justice is going to tell us to begin to think of others above ourselves. So three, three practical things that you can do to do justice. You can fight for rights, which is also called advocacy. That working within communities that are affected by these things, you can begin to advocate for systems, laws, things to be changed. You can begin to be a voice for the voiceless as we join them in the cause for justice. Another way is just a practical way, super practical. Provision of needs, distribution of basic needs. We can ensure that people have access to food and to shelter and to safety and to all education and to some of the basic foundations that each of us has had. All of our lives have been built on something, but it takes time for change to happen in people's lives. So the foundation has to start somewhere. Some of these basic things people don't have access for. So the provision of needs is definitely one of the steps towards providing justice for the word, world. And the last one that I'll share is the distribution of power. This is a tough one. Uh, we have to allow the people that are affected by some of these injustices to actually have a real voice and real power, which means in some ways we have to give up some of our power in order to hear someone else. And that's tough because that makes you vulnerable. You have to like listen to like some of the ways that people have been affected by these things, how they say that they actually need help. And we need to listen to them, empower them, and distribute the power more appropriately. That is a way that you can start to see a system start to break down is when power is redistributed in a healthy way where people have equal access. In a sense, the communion table, this isn't in here, but I'm going to talk about it. The communion table is a way that that happens where we all gathered around a table. It doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, who you know. It doesn't matter. We all equally come to the table neutral to like who we are because Jesus is here to feed all of us equally regardless of where we come from. That is a perfect picture of justice as God feeds us at at the table, we all come equally with the need that we have for him to fulfill. And he equally distributes to all of us his goodness, his mercy, and his righteousness as he gives us his, his very self. 
So we can't only do justice, but we also have to love. And that's what this passage talks about. It talks about doing justice, and it talks about loving mercy. So this word mercy is actually a very powerful Hebrew word called hesed. And hesed is, it can, be, it can be translated a couple of different ways, loving kindness. But hesed is a love. It's a loyal love. It's a steadfast love. It's a committed love. Hesed is not just like an action. Hesed is more of like a position and a posture of your heart. So like justice is very active. Like you have to do something. Like you have to actually engage in some kind of act where hesed is more a position that we come as we do as we do justice. Our heart actually has to be transformed in the way that we do that. So an example in the Old Testament is the book of Exodus, where it uses this word hesed. In Exodus 34, um, and as, as he passes in front of Moses, um, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, abounding in hesed, maintaining hesed, love, to thousands and forgiving weakness, rebellion, and sin. This is the position that God comes to all of us. So think about this. I talked about in the very beginning of the sermon how all of us are messed up. Like no one here is not messed up, okay? Guaranteed fact, okay? So we're all, or at least we're all in, in good company. Um, so we're all messed up. But what the thing is that God does differently than what we can do is God has this commitment to his word and to his people that transcends our behavior. Like we could, ne like we, you're never too far from God's love. Like it doesn't matter how messed up you are. That's what hesed love is. It's God's commitment to his people. So even though Israel was off course, Mike is saying, hey, you got to do justice. You also have to love mercy, not because you're capable of loving mercy yourself, but because that's the God that we serve. We are just mirroring who God is when we love mercy, when we have hesed love, a committed love. And a guy shared this with me when I was just getting clean. And uh, when I first got clean, obviously, when you feel horrible about yourself, you think you're just like trash because your whole life has been doing things to get drugs that are horrible. This one guy, Benji, who became a great friend, said to me, he goes, Vito, don't believe in somebody. Cause I was there trying to like be, I was trying to be like, I wanted people to accept me. I wanted them to welcome me into their community. I wanted to be a part of them. He said, don't believe in someone, but find someone who believes in you. And I was blown away because that's what God's done for us is God is committed to us regardless of what we've done, where we come from. It's the perfect representation of love is this hesed love. So as you're doing justice, it's going to suck. Because people are going to hurt you. People are going to take stuff from you. People are going to take advantage of you. People are going to be difficult to deal with. But that is the cost that God has done for us in Jesus. So as we do justice, we have to also love mercy because if not, our hearts will turn wrong. And if your heart turns wrong when you're trying to help someone or walk with them or think they should do what you think they should do, it's going to mess you up. And you're not going to be loving mercy because we're following the example of Jesus. It takes a commitment to do justice. It takes a commitment to love someone when they're in an unlovable position. But God did that for us in Jesus. He loved us when we were in an unlovable position. That's what he calls us to do. And it's hard. But he calls us to it because that's who he is. And he's trying to let us mirror him to the world. To do justice, to love mercy. Now, the last point, almost, to walk humbly. So this is an interesting thing. I didn't know this, but the word, the word right here, walk humbly, um, is actually this word walking, is this word, man, I'm getting into Hebrew today. It's called, uh, ha, it's, uh, in Jewsyism, it's the word hakalah. I probably said it wrong, which means walking. But the idea of walking, it actually is the way they describe ethics, 
So it's like how you do your day-to-day life. So this idea of walking is not like, it's not like something that you do. It's like, in a sense, something that you are, something that you're becoming. It becomes a part of what you are. So as we're doing justice and loving mercy, we're learning to walk as God walked in Jesus to bring about the healing of the world. And my wife, Amra, is an orientation and mobility specialist. And no one probably knows what that is unless you talk to her. Well, guess what that is? It's someone that teaches someone that's visually impaired or blind how to use their cane, how to navigate the world. Well, when she was doing her master's degree, she blindfolded me because she had a practice. And what happened, once I put that blindfold on and I had to walk one, I, was, I like, would be horrible if I lost my eyesight. But another part is that it put a different perspective on for me is now I was blind and I had to learn how to navigate the world differently. So what I think this idea of walking with God is, humbly, is it means that you have to sometimes put on someone else's perspective. Like you may have your perspective and you may be talking to someone and be like, I don't understand, how come they can't get this? It's really simple. We got to sometimes put ourselves in someone else's shoes and try to walk as they're walking because that will allow us to have humility in our relationship and helping them, but also allow us to have humility and understanding that we have to be dependent on God to change people because we can't change people. So we have to walk as Jesus did. So as we walk humbly, we learn to put on other perspectives. We begin to see the world as uh, through other people's eyes. Because I, you know how many times I have, it just causes us, walking humbly causes us to navigate the world differently. And I could tell you a million stories of all kinds of people with every kind of excuse and every kind of reason for things. But when you really can kind of like, you got to come from their world, their perspective to understand how they're trying to navigate a world that is different than the world that I navigate because I'm not them. So this idea of walking humbly. But in walking humbly, we also have to do another thing. Jesus, when in the book of Matthew, and when he did, he called his early disciples. And what he did is they're standing there and they're fishing and they're throwing their nets. And he says, come follow me. And they literally leave everything they've known, their livelihood, their families, and they follow this stranger. And he says, follow me. So this idea is God is not only telling us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly, but he's saying to follow him. He has something for everyone in these seats today to do. He has something for all of us to do. There isn't one person that doesn't have something that God is calling you to do because God says, follow me. He doesn't say sit there and study. He doesn't say read the book on ethics. He says, follow. Following is an active act action that he's calling us into deeper relationship and community with him because he has a mission. Christianity is not a thing that we sit there and reflect on, even though reflection is good. Christianity is an active thing that we do, that we engage in. He calls us into a mission. And the mission, he doesn't call us by ourselves, but he calls us as a community. Because to be a Christian means to be a part of something. Not just me and God being right, but me, God, and my family, the church being right together as we walk with God on a mission. So the church, I love the church. I love the church so much, okay? Even though I don't get to like do pastoral ministry every day, I love the church with everything I have. You know why? Because the church is God's rescue plan. It's not me by myself. It's not like a super nonprofit. It's the church. That is the rescue plan for the world. Guess what? You want to say all those news articles we read, all the things we see in ourselves, what's the solution to all that? Well, God has instituted it in the local church. And it says in the book of Colossians this, Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For God was so pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. God is reconciling all things, all the brokenness he's making right. 
whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. God's bloody murder is the way the world gets healed. Through his death and his resurrection. And he institutes the church to bring about his mission. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. The church is the way God does this. It's through all of us. Some practical ways that we can think about this. One, if you're not involved in the church yet, get involved in this church right here now. There's a million things you can do. Serve kids ministry, do hospitality. Maybe you have some skills musically. Maybe you want to um, help participate in a small group Bible study or join one of the ministry partners. There's a million ways I'm sure that Matt, the elders, and the deacons can connect you because being part of a community means that we're called to do it together. So God calls us into relationship and into community to serve, to live out the goodness and kindness of God. So serve in your church. Also, Christ may be calling you, God may be calling you to walk humbly with someone in your life right now. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's someone you went to school with. But God calls all of us to walk humbly with him, but also to walk with others. God calls us into relationships, and each one of us is individually, uniquely positioned in the world. God has a purpose for every single one of us. You are uniquely positioned right now where you are to bring about the healing of the world through the resurrection of Jesus, every single one of us. God doesn't make mistakes. He sets us up in the places that he wants us to bring about the whole healing of the world. God's plan to rescue the world is you. That's the plan. The plan is the church. It's each of us. And we can do that in large ways, or we can do that in really simple and small ways. There's no measure on it, but if we collectively do it, we believe that God is doing this through Jesus Christ. The church and you are living examples of justice. That I titled this sermon, Walking Justice. Because what should happen is that doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly, they're kind of like the ingredients. Like we can't do it without, like without Christ, forget it. Like we can't be an example to people. We need to have Jesus. But those are kind of the ingredients, and they create a lifestyle that reflects justice in all that we do individually and collectively. And we become an example of walking justice to the world. We're healing where things happen. Uh, yeah, my brain just was like, boom. But uh, <laughs> what I meant by that is I'm just thinking, and I just like in one moment, like a snapshot of a thousand things happen. I think about addictions being, people being walked away from addictions, people that are homeless being housed, marriages that are broken being fixed, uh, people that struggle with mental illness getting the treatment they need in the caring communities and the environments. I'm thinking about relational conflicts. I'm thinking about systemic injustice. I'm thinking about people, sacri I know there's people in this church sacrificing to go teach kids in Chester and all these different ways that God calls us to be walking justice in the business world to give people a chance and a job or to have have the right hiring practices there's so many ways that like when we actually buy into what the good news of Jesus is he releases us to be his healing presence in whatever we do he calls us to it He's actually doing it. We just need to listen and follow. Like, it's not like we're doing it. It's him doing it through us. So that's why my brain went that way, because I thought about, and I think about people, and you think about all the ways, and you're like, boom, there's like a billion ways. Everyone should tell each other the ways that God's using them in their life, and that would be amazing, because that's what this is about. This, this passage on Micah isn't to be like, it's not like, this is like what we become when we get aligned with what God is doing. We become walking justice. So... With that, I'm wrapping up, it's 10.53. But uh, what I wanted to say is uh, God calls us to walk and live out justice in our lives. And if there's things that are st stopping you from doing that or blocking you from doing that, like ask for help. You know what I mean? Get involved in service. Get involved in a home group or a Bible study. And uh, allow God to use you in powerful ways. So my word to you, Liberty Church, is this. Liberty Church Mainline. Be a church that does justice, loves mercy, 
and walks humbly with our God. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for your good news of Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for being rescued from sin and death so that we can be liberated and freed to serve the world. We thank you for the way that you call each of us individually and collectively to serve. We pray that we can truly become walking justice for the world. We pray that we don't see these problems as not part of our uh, we don't see these problems as something distant from us, but we see these problems as something very tangible that you call us in to participate in the restoration and the healing of. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 Vito, thank you, brother. I often wish that I had half of the heart that that man has and half of the energy that that man has. And Vito, I love that you point us back to the source every time and you teach us about God and who he has been in your life and what he can do for us in our lives too. So thank you. To the back part of our service together where the next thing we'll do is share in a creed. The creed is sometimes our statement of faith outwardly, but I would find for myself it's also a reminder of what God has done for us and for me. That this is a love story to us. So let me ask if you would stand, Liberty Church, and we'll share in the Nicene Creed together that's printed for you in your worship folder. Let us say together what we believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who was spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You can be seated. We'll come now to the Lord's table, and this is an invitation from Jesus to all who would follow him and know him to become part of his body, to take him into you, and to be a member of his body that loves you and owns you and knows you. What we'll do is begin with the great thanksgiving, we'll have the band lead with the plain fonts, and together we'll sing the bold fonts. <laughs> So with you, lift up your hearts now. We lift them to you, Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our Saving God. It is right and good. resurrection overcame the power of sin and gave us new life. 
Therefore we join our voices with all the saints and angels in the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name, saying, Jesus from death to life. Through his victory over the grave, we are set free from the bonds of sin and the fear of death to share the glorious freedom of the children of God. In his rising to life, he promised eternal life to all who believe in him. We praise you that as we break bread in faith, we shall know the risen Christ among us. Together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Jesus was betrayed. He shared a last supper with his disciples. He took a loaf of bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, saying, take and eat this, all of you. This bread is my body broken for you. And in a similar way, after supper, he took a cup of wine and said, take and drink this, everyone. This cup is the new covenant in my blood so that sins may be forgiven. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Just for a brief word of instruction, all who follow Jesus are invited to this table. This is an open invitation to come and share this communion. So we look forward to celebrating this meal together. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, this time can be for you as well. And we'd invite you to consider the prayers that are in the worship folder. You're even welcome to come forward if you like. I'd be happy to pray for you. Uh, but don't feel compelled that you need to take elements that, that are part of a sacrament that are not important to you today that way. When you're ready, you may come down the central aisle, tear off a piece of bread and dip it into the cup of your choice. The larger one is wine, the shorter one is juice. And we have prepackaged gluten-free elements if you like for any reason, just ask for those when you come up front. Vito, could I ask if you would come help me serve today? I think that would be lovely if you'd be willing to help. Yeah? These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
ask you to keep standing now as we turn to these prayers of the people. This is an opportunity for us to bind our hearts to the cares of God for the church and his people around the world. Um, let me pray for us in three short prayers, and after each one, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, together we can say, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Father, today we've heard and know that there are people who are struggling for food, um, kids who are struggling for school and education, uh, that there are very real needs in the city and community around us. We pray, Lord, that our hearts could be soft and open to these needs, that our eyes would be open, and that our energy would be high and unending as yours is for those people, for the needs that they have, and that we could represent the love that Jesus has by making sure that their bodily needs, the needs that you have, um, meant to provide for them, will be taken care of. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, it's a blessing that we can come freely to worship you this morning without fear. We pray for our sister churches who are meeting under shrouds of secrecy or seeking to survive real war around them. We lift up to you, our brothers and sisters around the world and the neighbors they minister to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, today we give you thanks for all the individuals who take on leadership roles here at Leader uh, Liberty. Thank you for the teachers in the kids' rooms, the home group leaders hosting and preparing studies, the deacons who willingly join people in their crises and go to help them, the elders and teams who work on the next steps that we have as a church. And we say thank you for the musicians, the worship leaders, for our staff, for Ty and for Matt. We couldn't do this without all of this team and we pray that you fill them with your spirit, your rest, and your strength to continue on our, on our shared mission to live, speak, and serve as the very body of Christ here in the main line. Lord, in, our, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us continue to pray as our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Uh, as we turn to our final song, if you are not yet a financial partner with Liberty, we invite you to do so and treat that as a part of your worship as you return all the, a portion of the gifts that God has given to you back to his use and for his kingdom and for this church. Let's turn now to our last song together. hear these words of benediction as we go forth together. May the God of peace who raised to life the great shepherd of the sheep make us ready to do his will in every good thing through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.